How's everybody doing? Emprendedores de Puerto Rico, ¿cómo están? Bien? Muy bien. I'm also doing great, thanks for asking. So uh, here the other day, I was in a great mood. I was having a phenomenal day, and I was at the airport. I had a couple of minutes to spare, so I picked up this science magazine. And I was reading about how the, the race of humanity is impacting our planet Earth. Okay? I give you a mental note here, everybody. If you're in a good mood and you plan to stay in a good mood, do not pick up a science magazine and read about how we are affecting planet Earth, because it is a sad, sad story. Isn't it frustrating how humanity, like we are the only species on the planet that do more damage than good? Isn't that crazy? That if we were to go extinct tomorrow, the world would be a better place for all the other species. Right? Ecosystems would start to recover themselves after human destruction, and all these other species would start basically having a much better time. There we go. I think that's extremely frustrating. Like, take out all, any of the other animals, and the ecosystems would collapse. We have these little ants here. If we took out the ants, ecosystems would collapse, and hundreds of other species would go extinct as well. Take out human beings, and everyone else will be better off. That's kind of sad. But not only are we destroying nature and destroying this beautiful planet we have, we're also destroying each other. Like, we are our own biggest threat. Have you thought about that? That the only ones killing humans are humans, right? So not only are we damaging nature, we are also allowing that we have people starving where there's an excess of food in other places. We're allowing people to die from diseases where we could have cured them, but we don't, we don't kind of care about providing health care to those people. People are, are homeless in the, in the city of San Francisco where people are living in multi-million dollar homes. I thought that was kind of frustrating. And then I was thinking, well, so I, I was an entrepreneur in, uh, in Denmark, and I moved to San Francisco. So four years ago, I, um, I was in San Francisco, and I was thinking about this idea of entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs are problem solvers, right? Right? You are there to solve problems. So this must be a fantastic place to find real good problem solvers in the heart of Silicon Valley, where the most innovation happens, where the most money is, where the most brilliant people in the world is, except from Puerto Rico, of course. <laughs> but you have a lot of talented people there, right? A lot of money, a lot of technologies, and all those people. So they must really care. They must really, I must be able to find a lot of entrepreneurs here who do really meaningful stuff. And I was kind of sad to see um, the big problems that people are working on in these places. Right? You go around and peep, most of these brilliant young individuals, they are devoting so much energy, so much time, and so much power, so many resources, into solving these non-existing problems. Most people care about building another platform for photo sharing, another application for finding a restaurant, or another sexting app where you can uh, find your next um, partner or whatever it is, right? Very few people actually care about some of the big problems. And I think that's, that's something we should change. Would you agree? The, um, I'm having track here. Uh, Vino Kostler, you know about Vino Kostler? Uh, one of the founders of Sun Microsystems. He's now a very, very famous uh, VC and a serial entrepreneur. He's a great guy. And he talks about how the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. Right? Every big problem represents a huge opportunity for the entrepreneur. For whereas all other people are just kind of ignoring what's going on in the world and just accept the way the world is, the entrepreneurs, those that have an entrepreneurial mindset, they see all these problems and they think about opportunities, as we've heard from other speakers. And the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. So if you were to grow some balls and actually target some of the hard problems we have in the world, you will have a much bigger opportunity as well. How many of you want to be filthy rich one day, earn a lot of money? OK, so that's, that's a pretty good incentive for some of you. How many of you want to have positive impact in the world? All right, that's good. There we go. But the beautiful thing is you can do both, right? We're starting to now see a change in mentality around people where before it was this, if you're trying to do something meaningful, you're not allowed to take a salary. There was a great TED talk about this subject, how if you're working in a nonprofit, for example, you can't take out more than $50,000 a year. 
because then you're stealing people's money, right? Well, guess what? The ambitious people are then not going to work for nonprofits. They're not going to be willing to live with that kind of uh, with it in, a, in a place where they're not allowed to make money for themselves. But now there's a fundamental paradigm shift around you should be allowed to have meaningful, make meaningful change and also make money. So what we tried to do with startup experience is work with young entrepreneurs to build for-profit social ventures where you can make a bunch of money but while doing something good in the meantime and actually solving real problems. So I started this company called Startup Experience and I've had a chance to work with a lot of phenomenal young entrepreneurs like yourselves in about 15 different countries. And uh, today I want to share some of the things that we've learned, some of the things that we've seen work really well for those entrepreneurs and some of the things that you might not want to do. Entrepreneurship is about failure, but could you avoid making some of those mistakes? It might be, uh, you might be better off anyway. So we've been to all these different places, and one of the things we've seen is that I good ideas don't care where they came from. A lot of people think that's an excuse. Well, I'm not in Silicon Valley. I don't have easy access to all this capital. I can't find engineers from Stanford or wherever, MIT, Harvard. So of course, I'm not going to be able to build something big. Yes, you can. Great entrepreneurs are everywhere, and good ideas are everywhere. So there's no excuses. And we're going to go back to that theme again, that one of the most important rules is that you don't allow yourself to set up excuses. So I've had a chance to travel around to these different places, and um, just want to tell you a couple of different stories. Uh, one of them was in Turkey. It was interesting how um, I went there and I worked with the Turkish entrepreneurs on some of the social challenges they have in that country and how we can transform those problems into opportunities for new ventures. And one of the entrepreneurs that I met, her name was Tutri, a Turkish woman uh, who had a brother who was visually impaired, completely blind. And um, she thought that was a pretty big problem for her brother. And she saw how difficult it was to get around because they were not from a very wealthy family. They couldn't afford having a private driver take him around to ever, wherever he was going. So he needed to take the public transportation take public transportation. And it was so difficult to get on the bus at the right place and get on the train um, to the right destination. So she came up, well, that's an important problem. I'm going to try to look and see if we can build a product that can help him solve that problem. And uh, she came up with this amazing uh, application. She's now working with the bus companies in uh, Turkey where they will supply her with all the data she needs to build an application so where, when her brother walks up to a bus stop, through GPS, it will locate where he's, where he's at right now, what time it is, and it will talk to him and tell him what is the next stop, what is, where is the next bus going, uh, is it delayed? So there are GPRS units in the buses. It will actually tell, her, tell him where he can expect to, when he can expect to arrive, and uh, how he can find his way around. That was kind of an interesting um, thing. And the example here also indicates the importance of you having um, a real like truly caring about the problem you're working on. It is very difficult for an entrepreneur to try to solve a problem that they can't really relate to. So we always try to encourage the entrepreneurs we work with to work on a problem that they really care about, and ideally also that they actually have themselves. If you're trying to solve a problem that you have yourself, you are going to keep you know, working on that solution until you actually solve your own problem. And you know when you've solved that problem. If you're trying to solve a problem for people in China and you're not Chinese and you don't understand the culture and the language, you're going to have a very, very hard time finding a solution that is actually applicable in that market. So try to at least, if you're not the user of your own product, then go and live a day in the life of a user or a week in the lives of the user. Go out there, spend time if you're working in healthcare, hospitalize yourself, break your arm, or maybe not, but Go to the hospital, right, and live in that hospital. See what's going on. What is the context? Try to understand all the different factors so you can build a product that truly works in that context. Another example is when we went to India and we worked in uh, Bangalore um, where I realized that there are about 263 million rural farmers in India. It's almost the whole total population of the US. It's pretty crazy. And these farmers are in a very, very difficult situation because they have almost no money. They don't even own the land, right? So they're leasing the land. And if, if, the, um, if the harvest fails just one year, they're going to go into deep, deep poverty because they have to lend, loan money from these loan sharks that will 
you know, charge them a completely obscene amounts of money in, in interest, and they will never have a chance to pay that back. So you actually have millions of people living as slaves in India because the harvest failed one year, and now they can't pay it back. And that's the only way they can make a living. They don't have any education. They don't have access to technology. So therefore, they also don't have access to any information around what kind of crops to grow. So they grow the wrong crops, and then there's no demand after they harvest. Right? They can't sell it. And the only way to sell is through these middlemen who also rip them off. Right? And uh, yeah, I know it's really a happy, happy theme I've chosen here for this talk. Um, so they don't have access to weather forecasts either, and they don't have any technology. So I worked with these entrepreneurs on coming up with ideas. We had the Intel Foundation involved. We have the government of Karnataka, this region around Bangalore, involved in coming up with ideas and supporting these entrepreneurs that came up with services that could help those farmers get access to that kind of information. So they could understand what is actually the real market price for my crops, and how can I, help dis how can I distribute these products in a most more efficient way instead of going through these farmers, how can we provide micro lending solutions for some of these people? Really fascinating stuff, solving a real problem for a lot of real people. And as I mentioned, 263 million people. Does that sound like a big opportunity for you guys? Just a couple of dollars from, the, from each of those farmers and you have a very, very profitable business. So there's a big opportunity here as well. Lastly, um, I worked a lot in Mexico, and one of the, my favorite companies down there called Flor de Mayo, where they've identified a big problem with all these rural indigenous women specifically. Most of them are uneducated. They don't have a lot of kind of normal skills to work in the, in the workforce in big companies, but they're really good with their hands, and they're very creative, and they love kind of doing these indigenous kind of um, traditional handcrafts. The problem is the market is already saturated with those types of things. So they don't have an opportunity to sell a whole lot of it, and they can barely make ends means. So what these girls did from Tech de Monterrey in, uh, in Mexico, they went to New York, and they tr went to the fashion industry and tried to understand what are the designs that are really hip right now. Right? So the hipsters went to New York, and they understood something about design. What kind of designs are people requesting? What kind of garments could really sell? And then they went out to these rural indigenous women and they helped them understand what kind of designs they should create in order to be more successful with their businesses. And then they helped distribute those products after all as well. So now they have a product, the profitable business where they invite these rural women, provide them with jobs, pay them a reasonable salary, and it's a profitable company because they're selling these garments at a pretty high price because there's some social responsibility involved as well. Okay. So those were a couple of examples, but uh, as we've heard from, uh, from Bill, entrepreneurship is an extreme sport, right? You are going to fail, my friends, probably m numerous times, but hopefully you will succeed one day, right? But if you're not willing to fail a couple of times, you probably want to pack your stuff and get out of this room right now, because you're in the wrong place. Entrepreneurship is a business of failure. You need to make those mistakes. You need to to go out and test your own luck a number of times before you'll be successful. That's just how it is. And if you can't deal with that fact, then uh, you're probably in the, wrong, in the wrong business and wasting your time at this conference. Uh, that's also why investors, right? In, when investors, they build a, a, an investment portfolio, they plan that nine out of 10 companies are not gonna make it. They hope that maybe one of those companies are gonna make it. But they all realize that when an entrepreneur come and they say, Look, man, I'm, I'm sorry I wasted all your money, but I have a new idea. Are they going to invest? Do you think they're more likely to invest in the entrepreneur who already failed a couple of times than a brand new one who never tried anything? How many people think that it's more likely they will invest in the person who tried already? Yes, you are correct. You build experience every time. Every time you go out and do something, you will learn from that. So what we'll talk about is how you can then fail as fast as possible. The worst thing you can have as an entrepreneur is slow failure, right? Because you're wasting time, wasting money, and you're not going to uh, succeed eventually. So we learn by doing. However, um, there are a couple of things that we might want to do to avoid spending too much time with all this failure stuff. Why do startups fail? No ideas? Why do startups fail? What's that? They're starting with a product instead of. Well, um, like you have a product and you're like in love with your product 
You're in love with your product instead of, you don't have any customers, right? You're in love with the product or your idea instead of being in love with the problem you're trying to solve. Good answer. All right, thanks for that, Justin. You want to be in love with your problem that you're trying to solve, not the idea, not the product you have in mind. Yeah, why else? Um, not shipping. You're not shipping? You're trying to perfect the product for too long before you ship it, right? Yeah, there's a good rule of thumb that you actually need to be embarrassed about the first version of your product. If you're not embarrassed about the product that you sell the first time, you have waited too long. You ship too late, right? So you want to be embarrassed when you sell it out to customers for the first time. It's like, yeah, I'm sorry. It's kind of crabby, and it's, it still has some bugs, but here it is, right? Test it out, and let me know what you think. That's how you want to feel the first time you sell a product to a customer. OK, a couple of other things. The number one reason, and that comes as a surprise to a lot of people, is it's not about the product or anything like that. It is that co-founders break up because they don't communicate well. It's something that we don't talk a lot about in, in entrepreneurship education and entrepreneurship courses, but that is the number one reason. And Carlos mentioned this in the beginning. Who do we have in this room? Who are the hackers? Raise your arm. Hackers? OK. Hustlers? Who are you? And hipsters, how many artists do we have? Great, so we have a wonderful room of people here with different skill sets and diverse backgrounds. Do you communicate in the same way? No. Do you have the same needs as a person in your professional career? No. Right? It is fundamentally different the way we communicate as a hacker versus a hustler versus a, as a designer. And to have a well-functioning startup team, you need to understand those differences. And as a startup founder, you need to focus on how can we create a good team where it is allowed to have you know, these different types of communication styles. Because if you come in and you're like a hustler, you're so pumped up, you're so excited, and you just talk to 10 customers, and you come down to the engineering team, like, hey, guys, I just found out that we are doing something completely wrong. We have to change everything. Is that cool? Is that cool? We have to change completely, because it's totally wrong what we're doing. How are the engineering team, the, these super introverted engineers who are sitting in a dark room, and they've just spent you know, 200 hours building this new feature? Are they going to be happy about that message? No. So you probably want to deliver that in a slightly different way. Right? Otherwise, they're going to get very demotivated. They're not going to like working for you or with your team. So think about how to communicate. And it's not because the product couldn't be built. I trust that you're pretty smart people, right? Or maybe not. Are you pretty smart people? Right? I thought so. Right? So we have a lot of smart minds in this room. And there are a lot of technologies out there. Most products could be built. That's not the question. The question is, is there anyone out there who are willing to pay us something for that product? Right? People don't want your product. People don't care about your product at all. People care about solutions to their problems. And that's why we need to get into the mind of the user so we un truly understand what is the problem that they have and what is the context of where they live so we can build a product that truly fits that exact context. And when you're pitching, some of you might be pitching to investors during this conference, right? Or pitching to potential co-founders. Please don't start by talking about all the functions in your product. I see this all the time that people come up to me at a networking event and say, hey, Henrik, how's it going? Can I tell you about my startup? And it's like, yeah, sure, I'd love to hear about your startup. Cool, check this out. See all these features I've built into my product. It can also do this. And what we have next, we're gonna, it's going to be even more awesome. I'm going to be all these other features, features in my product. I don't care about your product. Right? I don't care about the features that you have unless you get me excited about the problem you're solving. So when you're pitching to an investor, always start by talking about the problem. Why is it important that we find a solution to this problem? If you can get me hooked on the problem you're trying to solve and, and the people you're trying to help with your product, then I would spend hours listening to your solution and to your pitch about your product. But don't start talking about the features before you got people excited about the problem. Secondly, they start building crappy products targeting everyone. For your startups, you want to have a lot of users, right? Yeah. Right? Wouldn't it be great to have 5 billion potential customers? <laughs> awesome, right? Huge market. Yeah, well, guess what? You can't afford to build a product that would work for 5 million people. Microsoft can, 
Google can, Intel can, there are a lot of other companies that can because they can allocate 5,000 engineers on building that product. But you can't. You are a scrappy little startup with very limited resources, so you want to put all your energy into building one feature that can solve one problem for one type of user. Okay? So instead of targeting everyone, you want to find who is that target market, those early adopters that truly have a problem. When we talk about a target market, you want to find people who, it still has to be a fairly large potential market, right? Because if it's like total of 10 people in the world, you're probably not going to, you're probably going to have a pretty hard time raising investment, right? But if you have a decently sized market and you have customers who truly care, and there is a sense of urgency, urgency being they're already looking for solutions, then you found your initial customers. And that's a good spot to be in. You want to start working with those people. Then later on, if you do that successfully, you can start expanding. You can add more features to your product, and you can start targeting other markets as well. But start with a very, very specific target market. You will, uh, you'll be very happy about that advice uh, down the line. And secondly, they don't solve important problems. They start solving interesting problems instead. What is the difference between an interesting problem and an important problem? Anyone? Interesting is something you get a response for. Well, so the, the diff yeah, I think you're on to it. So the difference between interesting and important is that something interesting, if you have an interesting problem, you're like, yeah, it's sort of annoying that I have to deal with this all the time, right? But I can manage. An important problem is something that could be life-threatening or something that is a huge annoyance to people in their everyday lives. If you're trying to solve an interesting problem, you're going to have a much harder time selling that product because you need to convince them that they have a problem first, and then you need to convince them that your solution solves that problem that they don't really have. Right? So try to find an important problem to look at. And as we just talked about, the good news is there are plenty of important problems. There are plenty of huge problems in the world. So grow some balls and start targeting those real problems in the world. OK, a couple of things that I wanted to share about when you're looking for a co-founder. Because I know some of you, you're kind of brewing on some ideas. And you, I talked to a couple of, of, of guys over here. And they want to find co-founders here. So these are some of the qualities that I've seen in successful founders and some of the things you want to look for when identifying a potential co-founder. First thing is, you want to find people who are willing to work before the money is available. There is a huge difference between being the first employee and being the founding member of a team. You think it's not that big of a deal? Because if you came in six months later, what's the big deal? Well, the founders were those who were willing to take the risk. And that might take six months. It might take a year, two years, three years, 10 years on building something you never know will ever be successful. Early employees, yeah, they might take a little bit of risk by joining a startup, but they still get a paycheck. Very different deal. They could be good employees, but they're not founders. And that's why they don't get rewarded with as much equity. You want to find people who are willing to do any job. As entrepreneurs, you don't have a lot of money, right? You're very scrappy. So you can't find people who are like, I have a, s a computer engineering degree from Stanford University, and I am so important. I'm going to be the king of coding, right? And everybody else here in the startup, you can go do all these other things, because I'm so important and I'm so awesome. You don't want to work with those kind of people. They might be smart, but they're going to be a huge pain in the ass down the line. Because you need people that are willing to pick up the phone, willing to assemble furniture, willing to take out the trash proactively, that they see a problem, they go fix it. If you have to tell people what to do, they're not founders, they're employees. And that's fine. They might be good employees, but just keep that in mind. They're not founders, and you're not equal in this business. I've, had, I've made that mistake myself. We were like four founders, but only two of us were founders. The other two were employees. We had to tell them what to do. But then you're already screwed because you gave them equity and you own an equal share of the business and it's very hard to reverse. Don't make that mistake. It's not afraid to share their ideas. That's one of the really big things. And that's one of the big cultural differences between a place like Silicon Valley and a place like Denmark and a place like uh, the Middle East and South America. That people have somehow gotten this understanding that if you have an idea, and I've even heard professors teaching entrepreneurship say this, Okay, I'm not going to say where, but they said, if you have an idea, 
the first thing you want to do is take this little idea and go to a corner and make sure nobody hears about it. Your precious little idea, <laughs> right? It's your little idea. Nobody should ever hear about it until you have a patent or until you have some kind of protection of that idea. That is wrong, OK? I have a friend called Bro Paul Bergiel. He's an investor in, in Silicon Valley. He says, um, ideas are like assholes. Everybody has one, nobody cares. <laughs> okay? Nobody cares about your idea. The idea is just a starting point. Execution is what matters. And guess what? If you go out and you share your ideas with everyone else in this room, I guarantee you, you will get so many new input and so many new open doors that you'll be able to out-execute everyone else that has the same idea. And there will be other people with the same idea. I guarantee it. There's no way you're the first person with that idea. And that doesn't matter. Facebook wasn't the first social platform. Twitter was the first instant messaging platform. It's all about execution. And you can execute better if you uh, communicate and if you share your ideas. Communicating effectively, understanding the dynamics in the startup team. Who do you need to communicate to effectively as an entrepreneur? Customers, right? Convince them of the value of your product. Who else? Investors, right? To get money. Potential. Employees, right? Or potential co founders, potential partners for your business. But for the co founders, essentially, in the beginning, right here, what you're going to be doing, meeting a lot of people with different skill sets, if you're not able to paint that vision that in a few years, this little idea, this startup company is going to grow huge, we're going to make billions of dollars and we're going to change the world, if you're not able to communicate that effectively, nobody's going to want to work with you, right? Because there's something called uh, opportunity cost. Right, the cost of jumping on this opportunity versus jumping on something else. So you need to communicate very effectively. That's why practicing your, your one minute pitch, your three minute pitch, your five minute pitch, your 20 minute pitch is really, really important. Celebrating mistakes, I think we talked about a little, little bit before. Failing faster is failing cheaper. So the sooner you can figure out that people don't give a rat's ass about your idea, the better. Because then you can start changing it, making those iterations as quickly as possible and learning from that every, every time. Last thing is, you now have people with intelligence, drive, and integrity. Which one is more important? All three, yeah. Which one is more important? It's the most important. Integrity. Yes, ka -ching. Bonus points for all you guys. Integrity is the most important point because if you find people that do not have integrity and they have a lot of intelligence and a lot of drive, they're going to screw you over. Okay, I learned this the, first, uh, the, the hard way with my first business, first semester in, in undergrad, high school, um, in uh, college, right? We had started this business with a classmate of mine. And we are reusing uh, used e computer equipment uh, from companies, from schools. They had all these computers, but we could get paid to go and collect those computers and then erase the hard drives, completely format the hard drives, and, and sell it on to Eastern Europe. Great business. We thought, well, this is kind of creating positive impact. We're helping these schools get access to cheap computer equipment. And we got our first order, and we're so excited. $30,000 for first semester undergrad students. We were pretty excited about that. So we got the money in the bank, and we said, yes, now we can finally incorporate, and we can, um, we can get that office so we can ramp up and all that stuff. And then I, I talked to my partner there, Brian. So what's going on with that money? Uh, can, we, can we now lock down that rental? And he kept avoiding me. And I was starting to get suspicious. Like, ah, what's going on here? It turned out he was already bankrupt. And all that money just disappeared down to a black hole, into a black hole, where all the investors and the bank, they had taken that money long ago. So he ended in a lawsuit and all that stuff. And if I had been you know, a little more hesitant, there was something edgy about this guy. Right? There was something wrong. But he was so driven. He was a little bit older than me. He had a lot of intelligence. So I thought, well, I'm going to take a chance. Uh, I don't really, there's something a little wrong, but I'm going to go for it, right? Don't make that mistake. It's going to bite you in the ass, I guarantee it. OK, guys, so only rule, there are no excuses. And I just want to see, so after here, how many of you will commit from this day onwards? This is the first day in the rest of your life, right? From this day on, how many of you are willing to commit to a vision that says that you're going to have positive impact in the, this world, stand up. From this day onwards, you commit to having positive impact in this world. Look around, guys. Everyone here has the same mentality. 
everyone here is willing and want to make a difference. A few people are still sitting down. That's OK. But most people here are standing, right? That's because you want to make a change. And if you help each other, entrepreneurs that collaborate are unstoppable. OK, so give yourself a huge round of applause, guys. You are going to change this world and make positive impact. There's no excuses. And um, screw it, let's do it, as Richard Branson says. This is all my uh, contact information. I'll be happy to answer any questions in the break. Shoot me an email. I'm always willing to help fellow entrepreneurs. I'll be around in the coffee break and afterwards. But uh, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure being here with you guys. Good luck with everything. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.